Our next speaker was a speaker last week, so I don't think he needs much introduction. But for those of you who weren't here last week, tell us again. Tell us again. Tell us again. The people want to hear it. Um, David Thaler is a managing managing principal and founder of DS Thaler and Associates. He, which is a site civil engineering firm that's been in Baltimore County in business for 43 years. Um, David has a cold this evening, so good thing you're not in the front row right here. Don't kiss me. <laughs> um, and I have heard that for people who are wearing bow ties next week, he extra is issuing extra credit. So <laughs> without further ado, David Thaler. Okay, thank you. Uh, I apologize, I have the cough from hell, so I'm gonna do the best I can. I wanna talk a little bit tonight about uh, two things if we have time. I wanna talk about uh, feasibility and due diligence in uh, land development and then get into uh, processing. Now needless to say, the extent to which, ooh, what's that? The extent to which a property can be developed and whether it can be developed at all is determined by its physical features and how they interrelate uh, with the regulatory process. And the items uh, which follow that I'm going to talk about for the next uh, half hour or so uh, should be carefully understood and considered prior to the purchase of a property. And I want to continue to use the general case study that we did last week and I'm hoping that when we talk next week about um, uh, financing that we use this case study as uh, well. Go back one, Kim. Okay, so we're going to uh, we're going to use the Helfrich property, which is about a 14-acre property uh, in uh, Woodlawn, and we're going to review, these are some of the typical things that we would review when we um, uh, do diligence of property. Now, I want to start with access. Um, and access is a fundamental uh, component of whether land is developable uh, or not. It is very unusual to find a, land, a completely landlocked piece of property but I found them, okay? And <laughs> Dave, you probably found one uh, uh, too. It's unusual, but it's not impossible, and you wanna make sure it's not you. But, uh, so while there's almost always access, it doesn't mean that the access is sufficient uh, to develop the property. And so this is sort of a, um, uh, a silly uh, example. But uh, you could have a narrow panhandle strip. It's not unusual, especially up country. A narrow panhandle strip going back uh, to the property. And the strip maybe is in a fee, might be an easement, might be a prescriptive easement. Could even be an easement by uh, necessity. And if you're going to develop, usually it's going to be on a public road and you need a fee title uh, uh, to the access to get out to the public road or you're not going to be able to um, uh, develop. Now in addition, next one Kim. So in addition, most jurisdictions require a minimum right of way of something between 40 and 60 feet for public roads typ uh, typically. Occasionally you'll find them uh, in Baltimore County, the minimum is 40, and occasionally you'll find jurisdictions that are much uh, uh, wider, but you need more. Now, that's not how wide the road is. That's how wide the right of way, the public, uh, the public space. The road might only be 24 feet, 30 feet, something um, uh, like that. But in addition to the right of way itself, because you're going to be typically grading um, a, a road, you're going to need, you may very well need easement rights on the adjacent property. So while the right of way might only be 50 feet, because you're cutting or filling, you might have to uh, have extra land on the adjacent property. What if you don't own the land? We have one just uh, like this. You know, what if the access is too narrow and you need, you need more? What do you do? Well, this is America, you know? Uh, you have to make a deal or you're out of luck. You don't um, uh, 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 develop and you may very well need uh, uh, grading rights. Now, the transportation article of the annotated code grants the state, the, uh, the state highway administration uh, access upon state uh, highways. And except for unusual conditions, usually restricted uh, highways, 
the state cannot totally uh, prohibit access uh, uh, to the public uh, road. But just because they can't prohibit access doesn't mean they can't screw it up, you know, for your uh, uh, development. And they have the right, uh, you need what's called an access permit. It used to be hard to get. Uh, until the Hogan administration, and then Steve Foster, the head access guy, 12:01 on inauguration day, he was gone. Now they're a lot easier. Now they're a lot easier uh, to get. And while the state can't prohibit access, they can control it. So this just happens to be the CVS on York Road, just below the uh, a Beltway. And what uh, is not uh, atypical, if the access isn't uh, great, you would not uh, to want to be. You would not want to come out of the CVS here and make a left because there's too much uh, uh, traffic, they'll have a one way in and a one way out. Now this is on Route 40. Let's say Baltimore, on this one, let's say Baltimore City is down here and this is the going to work uh, direction. Now if you're at Dunkin' Donuts, say, and you're a one way in and a one way out against the going to work uh, uh, direction, it's not gonna be very good. People like to drink their coffee on the way to work, not usually on their way um, uh, uh, back. Uh, and so you have to be very careful of um, uh, access. Now, um, failure to get access or a full access. Now this happens with residential property uh, uh, too. You might only, if it's a bad spot, we have one on Bel Air Road right now, uh, you might only be able to have a right in and a right out, out and that might be a terrible direction for marketing uh, your um, uh, a property. Now there are many requirements for the location of entrances and many of them are technical and far beyond uh, the level of this, uh, the scope of this course. There are several that are frequently encountered that when you're uh, doing a feasibility you ought to be aware of. Now entrances should generally be directly across from each other because if they aren't, it creates a what we call a lockup and it's unclear who has the uh, right of way. So generally entrances want to be directly across from each other or sufficiently far apart that you don't get a, um, a lockup. And, and while it of course varies, the general separation, the accepted standards is at least 100 feet. For a low speed highway, you need at least 100 feet uh, between the uh, entrances. Now in addition, there's a concept that I'm sure you've heard about, which is called sight distance, S-I-G-H-T, not S-I-T-E. And you can, have, you can have horizontal sight distance or vertical sight distance. There's a lot of them. You've got stopping sight distance. You can have a whole bunch of them. But the, the two that are most important to think about are horizontal sight distance and vertical sight distance. And horizontal sight distance, is you need to be able to see around curves. If you're going to put a new uh, road uh, right here on the inside of the curve, the car, when it parks here, and let's say this is somebody else's property, and there's some vegetation there, the car can't see around the uh, a curve, and the other cars come whipping around. Well, what do you do if you don't own that vegetation? and that guy doesn't want you to develop. Well, you're out of luck. This, this, is, this is America. You make a deal or um, uh, you can't go on his, unless it's in the public right away, out, um, unless this is in the public right away, you can't cut that vegetation. Now, if you're on the outside of the curve, you generally don't have a sight distance a problem. So in feasibility property, you want to be careful about the inside of curves, not so much the uh, outside of curves. Now likewise, next one Kim. Now likewise, there's a thing called vertical sight distance. And when you have a hill, um, you can't see over the top of the hill. So if you're bringing a new entrance in, you either want to bring it in at the crest of the hill or a sufficient distance uh, away um, so that uh, you have time to react with cars uh, uh, coming over the hill. Now, sight distance is, um, is technical, but as a rule of thumb, it's the design speed of the highway, let's say 30 miles an hour, times 10 plus 100. 
in feet. So if it was a 30 mile, um, it was a 30 mile an hour um, uh, design speed, it would be 300 feet plus 100 feet, 400 feet is what you would um, uh, 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 need uh, uh, here. Now, um, you may think, okay, that's all very uh, nice, um, but what does it really mean to me? So we had a job, we had a job with a thousand feet, it was actually 980 if I remember, a feet of frontage on Racerstown Road coming down uh, a hill. And if I remember it, um, if I remember, let's say it was five, let's say it was 480 feet. If I remember, if I remember it uh, uh, correctly. There was a light here and you had to be back 500 feet, uh, your entrance had to be back 500 feet up from the light and there was a hill here and you had to be 500 feet away from uh, the hill and there was no place, this was a thousand unit job on Rice's Down Road, there was no place where you could meet the criteria uh, and we ended up having to buy a piece of property uh, uh, down here and relocate the light. Not a very nice thing to do. It's nicer, these feasibility issues, they're the seller's problem before you close on the property. They're your problem after you close on the property. So you want to know about these uh, afterwards. I mean before. So let's go to our case study uh, uh, just a little bit. Uh, this is Dogwood Road. Uh, pretty straight, you got pretty good frontage uh, here. Uh, there is a hill, which uh, will be pertinent in a few minutes, uh, right here, but it's kind of straight and it's a kind of a gentle uh, slope here. So access on this particular property does not seem to be uh, a problem. Now the next here, uh, uh, issue to look at is the topography. Now. Um, it is possible, I mean, topography, uh, uh, the changes, the shape of a property are really fundamental to its uh, developable uh, ability. A site can be um, too flat to develop. We hit that on the eastern shore uh, all the time. It won't uh, drain. Usually you want it over 2% or it doesn't um, uh, uh, drain. We're doing a country club um, down in uh, Essex right now. Too flat, you know. Um, we have uh, ESD, which creates drainage issues, and on a 150 acre, acre uh, country club, we have only 10 feet of fall from one end to the other. Too flat requires 52 stormwater management facilities because it's so, so flat. Can't get the water in, can't get the water uh, out. More typically, around here in the Piedmont areas, we find, we deal with properties that are too uh, uh, steep and to a road really shouldn't be more than 8%. Uh, a 6% ideal, 2% about minimum, 6% ideal, 8% really the maximum. Driveways may be, if it's one guy and uh, they raise goats, you could go up to 18%, 16 or 18 uh, percent. But roads have to be relatively flat. Here in the Piedmont, it's not unusual to have slopes in excess of 25%. Uh, percent. Many jurisdictions, Anne Arundel County, uh, Baltimore County, uh, control a development on steep slopes. Steep slopes are generally more than 25 percent, sometimes more than uh, 15 um, uh, 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 percent. And so uh, you need to be uh, you need to be cautious um, uh, with uh, steep uh, property. Now. Um, well, there's uh, sort of all, all of the feasibility uh, uh, issues are kind of the same. There's two things to do. One, you go to the county, you go online, and you get all the records that you could possibly get. And almost every county today has some sort of GIS that gives you what the topo uh, uh, looks like. And as we go through this, you'll be able to find where the water lines are, where the sewer lines are. There's a lot of information. Uh, available from the jurisdictions, uh, and that's more and more online, you should get that. However, you should also go out and walk the property. Inevitably, I've been doing this 50 years, uh, you know, literally since I was a kid, and I can, I can see um, topo maps in three dimensions. Inevitably, it looks different in the field. 
Do you find that? I, you know, I certainly, I certainly do. You go out there, you see things that you wouldn't have seen on the public uh, records, and the public records show up stuff that you would never find yourself uh, in the field. So um, I uh, strongly recommend uh, that you go out and uh, uh, walk a property. We sent the surveyors out uh, once, and they came back with a sewer manhole cover that just didn't look right to me. It was in a really odd spot. It was in the middle of, of a yard. I said, this doesn't look right. And um, so I went out there, and sure enough, there was a sewer manhole cover. Now, there was no manhole under it, no sewer <laughs> under it, but it was a cover. You know, it's surveyor. What do you, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you expect, uh, really? So um, anyhow, let's come back to, let's come back to our Hellfitch. Uh, property. This one is pretty flat. Um, uh, we walk it. In fact, it looks like a pool table uh, sometimes. And here's what the property uh, looks like. It has. It was a country club, and um, uh, this is a field. In fact, it's suspiciously flat. It does. It looks too flat to be. Uh, uh, it's sending up a yellow flag uh, uh, to me how flat uh, it is. And uh, just while we're here, uh, there's something, there's a big red flag uh, here. Anybody, say, anybody tell me what it is? You, you, Tom, this white stuff? Oh, well that's just, that's old paving. That's old paving. But this is a monopole cell tower. Now we want to, we want to put moderate density um, townhouses here and, uh, and, and, multiple, uh, uh, and cell towers have two problems uh, with them. First of all, there's an old stigma uh, uh, you know, about them. I mean, the county 10 years ago just went you know, uh, you know, crazy kind of politically about the proliferation of cell towers, but two, they fall. Okay, and you have to calculate, they don't fall a lot, and they're calculated to fall in a certain, they, they don't fall like this, they break off in, in the middle, you know, when they exceed their uh, design uh, level. So you have to calculate the fall zone uh, around this, and you're going to lose a certain amount of development of developable um, uh, a, 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 a property around it, which we of course use for the open space, so and the dog park. So it'll fall on the dogs, you know. I, uh, you know, I, uh, I guess. Now, uh, Helfrich has another interesting. Go to the next one. It has a beautiful pond uh, uh, on it, which is full of fish. I took the director of planning out here, and we, and we, you know, and we uh, fished. It's the perfect. Uh, amenity or for stormwater management. But under the regulations, being the way they are, couldn't use it for either. The stormwater management, it didn't have a 378 embankment um, uh, on it. It didn't have the, uh, it didn't have the uh, right uh, structure uh, to release um, uh, the flows. And at least in Baltimore County at the time, open space had to be dry. It specifically said it had to be dry because the county didn't want people using stormwater ponds for, you know, for uh, open space. And so we used this amenity anyway, but we weren't able to get any particular um, uh, uh, credit for it. Now the next uh, issue is uh, water and sewer. Now in the metropolitan districts, uh, well, in the area around uh, uh, Baltimore and around uh, 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 D.C., in Baltimore you have the Metropolitan District. In the D.C. area, uh, PG in Montgomery, you have WSSC. Uh, uh, and so that um, uh, uh, water and sewer is provided by a public um, uh, uh, agency. Now, the way there's a couple ways to determine whether you have uh, water and sewer. You, of course, for most high density development, you want water and sewer, um, obviously. So uh, you can pull the records, and almost every jurisdiction has some sort of, um, you know, public records that you can usually get off the internet or go over to the public works office, and it'll tell you where the water and sewer um, uh, uh, is. Uh, as in my example with the manhole cover, you have to. Go go out and look uh, your uh, 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 self, 
Um, I like to go out there and if there's fire hydrants there, pretty well tells you it has an eight inch, you know, a line um, uh, under it. And I like to go find the manholes and pull the covers and see that there's really a sore uh, under it because there are errors um, in the uh, records. Now sewerage usually flows by gravity. Water tends to run downhill except when it's under pressure, you know. Um, and you have to make sure that you can get, uh, you know, actually get to the sewer in a gravity way across land that you own. They either you own or the public owns or you can get an easement uh, to. Now that's not always the case. Now here, the sewer ends somewhere over here and it goes downhill. So what do we do? Got to pump it. Okay, now there are two ways the pumps come in two flavors. Uh, the, first, the first flavor is a public pumping station. County, uh, a public pumping station, the, uh, depending on the county, is about a million dollars to start, you know? So this is a 59 unit uh, job. It would not be good to have an extra million um, uh, dollars here. In some counties, if other people can get into it, you could get some kind of a, uh, a rebate uh, back. But a public pumping station is pretty much a non-starter uh, for a small job like this. You got a thousand units, different story. Uh, so we can't do a public pumping station. What's our other alternative? Timberweed, what's our, what's our alternative? Grind it up. Grind it up. <laughs> Grinder pumps, okay, everybody know what grinder pumps are? They're big garbage disposals. They like sit in 55 gallon drums, they go in the ground and they have little green uh, uh, caps on them and it's, it's they're macerators and um, I think they're like magic. The sewage goes in, it gets ground up just like a uh, garbage disposal and there's a force main, it's a pump, that ejects the sewage uh, that can go really far. I, I, I think it can go 200 feet ahead. It can go up 200 feet um, uh, if you want. And so we put uh, grinder pumps here to pump up the street in a little piece, maybe a two-inch force main or, um, you know, or something like that. And a little bit to my surprise, it does not seem to have any stigma uh, when the houses are bought. They're, they're just cans, they sit out in front. Usually the Homeowners Association contracts with MES, the Maryland Environmental Service, or somebody like that to take care of them, and they seem to work uh, uh, just fine. Is there one grinder pump associated with each house? Or yeah, yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Until recently, we would often do them as twins. You'd have one can with two pumps uh, uh, in it, and it would go back and forth. But what would happen is the neighbors, the two houses, would fight. So one guy's pump would go out, the other guy, you know, uh, he wouldn't want to take care of it, and they would fight. And so now the county uh, requires one pump for every house, which with narrow townhouses, which health, health rich is affordable townhouses, is a lot of things coming in uh, the front. The grinder pump, the driveway, the gas uh, a line, the water line, and you have a lot of, of trouble getting it all to uh, a fit. You ask me, how do you get all this, you know, how do you get all this stuff uh, to fit? It's really uh, a challenge. Uh, we put the sore in the back. We had to get it out of the front, it was too tight. We stuck the sore. Uh, uh, in the back in this case. Do the have to go in an easement or can they... Easement. Have to be in an, to be in an easement. Somebody's got to be... It's a public health hazard. When it goes bad and the house is abandoned or whatever, somebody's got to be able to get in there and uh, fix it. What does grinder pumps cost per unit? 10,000. Rough number. Ten, you know, 10,000, uh, which sounds... Uh, well, first of all, the pump itself, the whole, the whole deal, the, the, the casing, the hookup, the, the, the meter is about uh, uh, 10,000. The pump is being paid by the builder, typically, not the developer. So that is negotiated in the uh, sales price of the deal. And you aren't having to, you aren't having to build an eight inch you know, gravity uh, soar. So it's not a $10,000 typically add-on. Ed? 
package units, correct? Yeah. And do, do you need someone to design the capacity of, like, say, you have 50 units on the head differential being able to pump it in that line? I mean, if yeah, I guess who that person is, you. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah you're the guy. <laughs> you need to do that. Ed just started with us on Friday, so. <laughs> um, I, I hope you can do that. <laughs> okay, next issue is water supply. Now, unlike uh, sewer, uh, water systems flow under pressure and not by uh, gravity, and so there's much, le much less uh, restriction. At least in, um, in the Baltimore uh, area, the metropolitan uh, district, they have to be under paving because when they go, when there's a leak, Baltimore City wants to be able to drive out, get over, get over uh, the line, fix it, patch the road and go and not be wandering around in somebody's backyard with pools and sheds uh, uh, over it. Um, and water, um, how, how do you know whether you have it? Two ways again, check the county records, it's publicly available, and always, always, always go out to the field and see if it's um, uh, physically uh, there. Um, uh, but just because you have water, sort of like everything else, does not mean that you have enough water for your particular uh, a job. An apartment job, a high-rise apartment job, I don't know, might require 100 gallons a minute. I just made that up. I don't know what the real number uh, uh, is. But you might not have sufficient water for uh, uh, your kind of uh, a project or sufficient pressure. Uh, for that uh, matter, and we do a thing called a fire flow uh, test, which is, uh, we don't do it, we order it, you should uh, order it, it's only like a 125 or 150 bucks, something like this, Baltimore City comes out and tests the capacity of the lines. Now unlike sewer, what you get with um, water, uh, water is, um, Water lines are typically ductile iron, or they have been until recently. I'm not really sure. I don't, you know, maybe some of the other engineers here know why water is made out of ductile iron. I've never figured out, uh, uh, I've never understood why, or had explained to me why, because iron rusts. And inevitably, this is what happens, and that's called tuberculation. It tuberculates, um, and when it rusts, when it tuberculates, it'll, it'll go down to, you know, to that much. Um, and you don't have the capacity in the line that you thought uh, you uh, had. Um, you want to know this, like all these feasibility issues, not to keep flogging this dead horse, you want to know this before you close on the property, preferably before you buy the uh, property, not uh, after. Having to reline, replace a water line, uh, or reline a water line, is not something you want to come at you uh, unexpectedly. But in addition to having the water and sewer physically available uh, 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 to you, there is another regulatory uh, requirement. There is a document called the Master Water and Sewerage Plan that every county is required to uh, uh, adopt. And the Master Water and Sewerage Plan shows those areas of water and sewer that are, have water and sewer now, will have it in the near future, and will never have it, or not permitted uh, to have it. And you might have a water line, or a, a sewer line, uh, running right through the middle of your property, which we've had on more than one uh, occasion, and, a, and you're out of the master water and sewer plan, and it is a political process to get back into the water and uh, sewer plan. You have to go to the county council, uh, which has to approve it, and uh, if there's community opposition, they might not uh, approve it. It then has to go to the Department of the um, uh, Environment. And so, you, uh, so the issues on water and sewer it has to be physically available. The capacity has to be appropriate. We're going to talk about adequate facilities uh, on a later uh, session. So you have to have, um, uh, they, uh, they, they have to be adequate, and you have to have the right designations, just like zoning. You have to have the right designation on the master and water and sewer plan. Now, if an area, next one, Kemp. Now, um, if an area is not served by water and sewer, uh, you can uh, use wells and uh, septic. Uh, uh, and if it's uh, uh, S7, W7, which would be the designation under the master water and sewer plan, you could use wells and uh, uh, septics. Um, 
Uh, however, uh, there is a new law uh, which I uh, referred to uh, 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 last week. We call it the tier, you know, the Governor of Maui's uh, tier bill, which restricts um, uh, subdivisions in the rural and agricultural areas to a maximum of seven. Three in Baltimore County, minor subdivisions, seven everywhere else. So if you have a thousand acre farm somewhere, uh, seven is the most uh, units that you could get using uh, 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 wells and, uh, and septics. Uh, wells, I guess everybody knows what a well is. There are, um, there are some uh, areas that are, no, uh, the Chestnut Ridge area in Baltimore County that are notoriously poor producers because the formations are, um, uh, are tight and you can have um, a half a gallon a minute and 50 feet away you can have 20 or 30 gallons uh, a minute. More typical, you have half a gallon a minute in these bad uh, of, of formations. Before, needless to say, before you close on a property that um, uh, is required to have a uh, well, uh, you have to have the well and have it tested. One uh, gallon, I get this call uh, uh, regularly, uh, 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 Dave, I just tested, I want to buy this property, I just tested the well, it's producing, I, I've got three teenagers and it's producing half a gallon, should I buy it? No, don't buy, <laughs> you know, no. Um, one gallon is the uh, minimum. It's been a while since, we, uh, uh, since we've had well uh, failures, they were pretty common uh, in the past. There's a thing called a critical yield test, but it's been a very wet, period that we've just come through. So it's not going to go up from here, it's going to go down uh, from here. And personally, you know, personally, if, um, if it wasn't, if it was anything other than my wife, and of course she takes long showers, but uh, um, I, I'd want, I'd, I'd want, say, a minimum of three gallons a minute or something uh, like that. One is the regulatory minimum, but that's cutting it now. I'm going to go. I'm going to go to seven. Okay. Uh, septic systems. Um, uh, septic systems. You can have a, 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 a septic system. We now have to have best available technology, which is to keep the nitrogen out of the groundwater, which ultimately finds its way uh, to uh, the uh, Chesapeake Bay. Best available technology is very uh, 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 expensive. Probably adds ten thousand dollars. $10,000 to a, um, a septic system. And in order to have a septic system, you have to have a perk test. You dig a hole, you go down, it, it varies by county, you go down 12 feet or so, you dig a little hole, you pour water in, and you measure how fast the water uh, runs out of the hole. If it goes too fast, it's gonna contaminate the groundwater. If it doesn't go fast enough, it's gonna back up. You, you want it to be medium, just uh, right, and the regulations um, uh, 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 very little bit uh, between uh, counties. All right, let's roll through this. Okay, floodplains. Um, I mean, water used to be just a wonderful amenity, uh, you know, for uh, houses until, I guess, climate change, you know. Uh, and now uh, water courses and uh, you know floodplains are a really big uh, issue. If nothing else, to close to close uh, uh, on a property, uh, you know, uh, with the flood uh, uh, with the floodplain, you have to uh, check the FIA maps, the Federal Insurance Agency maps, part of. Uh, uh, FEMA, you have to check the maps, and if you're in the uh, floodable uh, zone, then you have to have um, a federal flood insurance. Thank God for it. It's very expensive. It's not expensive enough. It, you know, it runs a, um, uh, uh, a deficit, but it adds a substantial cost uh, uh, to the house. Now, just recently, so um, the 100 year storm in, in Baltimore County was what, Brian? 7.6 inches? 7.1 inches that was just raised to 8.1? 8.65. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you see why I'm not doing heck, heck twos. Okay. So, for as long as I can remember, as long as I can remember the 100 year storm, that storm, which has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year, was 7.1 inches over a 24 hour period. 
boom, fiat, it's raised to 8.6. Well, your floodplain got really big, much bigger, as you might imagine, and the houses encompassed in the floodplain, requiring federal flood insurance, which you really need to get if you're you know, in a, a, a floodplain, got much uh, a bigger. So what is a floodplain? It's a, it's a, go to the next one, Kim. So is the area inundated by a design storm Currently, the 100-year storm, which keeps going uh, up. Got to be really careful uh, with this. And we take what's called a drainage area, which is the area draining to a particular uh, spot. And we uh, calculate certain characteristics of the area, the slope, the cover, uh, the characteristics, the, the time of concentration, how long it takes uh, 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 to get there, and we run, and actually run a computer model, it's now called HECRAS, Hydraulic Engineering Center, River Rhine, something or other, uh, <laughs> you know, HECRAS, and we can calculate, go back one, uh, Kim, and from that we can calculate how wide the floodplain is, and it's how wide, we don't care, from our point of view as land developers, we don't care how deep it is. The deeper, narrower the gorge is uh, what we want. When it's wide and flat, it could be hundreds of feet uh, wide and takes away a lot of uh, 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 property. Um, you can, uh, the only way to accurately determine a floodplain is to do the uh, analysis, which is not um, uh, inexpensive. But FEMA, FIA puts out maps. I'm sure we've all seen the floodplain maps. And they give you a reasonable idea of where the floodplain is. But those are really just for the big tributaries. They don't get down into the little uh, uh, tributaries. Uh, Kim, okay. So. Um, no matter how uh, attractive on, uh, a property looks uh, on its uh, surface, only Superman has x-ray vision, okay? And nobody can tell uh, what's um, uh, under there. Uh, so, and and uh, uh, underground problems uh, come in uh, two flavors, I guess. The first is rock. Okay, rock is bad news for uh, development, and it's all over uh, uh, the place. And if you have, you know, uh, moving a yard of dirt around might cost a couple bucks uh, a yard. Blasting and moving a yard of rock might cost 50, 60. Uh, you know, dollars uh, a yard, you know, something on that uh, order. Uh, you want to be like all these things, you want to be aware of these problems before you close on the property rather than um, uh, after. Now, typically, the bank will require a geotechnical uh, report. I've been doing this for a really long time. I'm an engineer, I can't figure them out. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's blow counts. What I like to do, the bank likes them. Um, the county likes them. What I like to do is get a backhoe before you buy a property, get a backhoe, what, 50, 60 bucks an hour, go out there and dig some holes. If, you, if the backhoe operator can get through whatever it is, it's not rock, and if he can't, it is, it is, it is uh, rock. And then you, send, you, you test pit wherever you need to uh, test pit and send the surveyors behind them to um, uh, make a permanent record of where the rock uh, is. And you basically have an underground map uh, of, uh, of where you have rock and where you don't have rock, and then you design uh, 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 to it. I hope I didn't offend any of the geotechnicals. Now the, um, uh, now the other sort of, uh, go back, uh, Kim. Okay, now the other uh, a sort of uh, subsurface problem is trash. We hit this all the time. Now you saw how flat the Helfrich property is in the Piedmont area, right up from the Patapsco River. Didn't that look odd to you? Okay, well it looked odd to, it looked odd to uh, me, and you, uh, you look at the property and then chomp, it goes down into a uh, ravine. Well sure enough, Mr. Helfrich, 
who is a kind of a well-known uh, real estate uh, guy, he wanted to put in some soccer fields here. So they were building the beltway or whatever they were uh, building, and he, he charged them to dump all the trash uh, you know, on the property and the concrete and whatever else, and he got tipping fees for it. And then he graded out nicely, put a little dirt on it and planted it, and it looks, it looks pristine. I, uh, I've, I've in, my, in my career, I've seen farmers do this numerous times, and, um, uh, and I've seen sophisticated developers uh, uh, buy property and then end up uh, with trash. And we just heard from uh, Mike Powell, uh, trash can often be contaminated. It could have hydrocarbons in it, you know, God knows what. Um, you want to know about the trash before you buy. You, you do not want your backhoe operator putting the sore, the sore in to find the trash before you find uh, 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 the trash. Now on Helfrich, we found a lot of trash, but we made a trash profile. Went out with a backhoe, figured out where all the trash was, and it went from one foot deep to eight foot deep. And we made a map of the trash. And our options were haul it out. We could figure a volume, haul it out, bring in good dirt, or, I had never done this before, put the townhouses on piles, on wooden piles. I had, uh, personally, I've been doing this a long time, I had never done it, but they drilled wooden, treated wooden piles, these are white townhouses, and put the townhouses uh, 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 on it. Our next uh, issue, we're gonna have a whole session on adequate uh, facilities. Um, and uh, uh, most jurisdictions today have some version of adequate uh, <laughs> have, uh, some version of adequate uh, facilities. They can be, uh, I mean, typically they're water, sewer, traffic, and schools. But then there may be, you know, whatever else: police, fire, libraries. It depends on the uh, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, uh, Baltimore County and Arundel County uh, certainly have them. Howard County has ado is adopting some very, uh, very stringent uh, adequate uh, facilities. And we're going to have a whole session really dealing with almost Howard uh, uh, County. Baltimore County, to the best of my knowledge, um, no, uh, no job has ever been stopped due to schools in the 30 years they've had school adequate uh, facilities, and I can only think of one job that was ever stopped due to uh, uh, traffic. In Arundel County, two-thirds of the county, uh, you know, two-thirds, three-quarters of the county is, um, uh, is uh, 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 shut down, and you have to be uh, aware about this. Sort of a companion to adequate facilities are impact fees. Uh, and impact fees go from zero in Baltimore County to uh, God knows where in Montgomery County. Okay, this is, I'm sorry? Yeah, that's just what I was going to say, uh, Tom. This is the, this is a chart you get from home builders. Um, that's my, I can't read it from here, but this is Montgomery County, $50,000, uh, Baltimore County, zero. However, a bill in the legislature is, because Baltimore County is running such a deficit, is going to have impact fees for the first time in Baltimore County, which, um, which tells you, get all your, there'll, there'll be, there's always grandfathering. You want the door slammed behind you, not in front of you. Got any, interested in anything in Baltimore County? You might be interested in Baltimore County. Oh, I had a conversation with David Marks about this. Yes. And he said, impact fees will come. I'm going to lead the charge, and I wrote my master's degree with impact fees. I'm surprised he got through elementary school. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, Baltimore County will have impact fees. If I had to guess, I would guess, nobody knows, I would guess $8,000 a unit versus close to 50, you know, or thereabouts in Montgomery uh, 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 County. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Something that we uh, uh, often overlook is suitable outfall. Okay, when you develop property, uh, 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 
uh, water runs wherever water runs. It runs from the, uh, the higher property to the uh, lower property. And Maryland has the natural, follows the natural flow rule of drainage, which says that the higher property, it's called the dominant property, has the right, an easement right, to pass the natural flow on the lower property, which has to accept the natural flow. But when we do development, typically, uh, more or less, we, uh, we capture the drainage and we release it, uh, you know, typically in some kind of a point source, out of a pipe or out of a weir or something uh, like that. It would be um, uh, uh, sort of unusual to release it as a, uh, as a sheet uh, flow. Well, in order to do that, you need what's called a suitable outfall. And uh, uh, nobody, really, I said, nobody really knows what a suitable outfall is. But if you don't have a suitable outfall, you're going to damage the downstream property, and that's a trespass. And it's basically, it's a criminal trespass, that actually, and that's uh, legal. And so a suitable outfall, what a suitable, um, uh, as Justice Potter Stewart said in a different context, uh, I, don't, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Okay, and so a storm drain or a road, a storm drain, a stream, those are all suitable uh, outfalls. An outfall that is non-erosive and stable that's not going to damage the downstream property. A cornfield, especially if you're discharging perpendicular to the rows, eh, that's not a suitable outfall. And so suitable outfall um, is not typically obvious. You have to be careful uh, about it. Uh, Mike talked about, uh, well, we talked about critical area. We still have critical area um, uh, applications uh, going through. Uh, if you're within 1,000 feet of the uh, Chesapeake Bay or its major tributaries, there are uh, certain stringent uh, uh, regulations. We're still getting growth allocations today. There are a few left but I'll blow through that. We talked about forest conservation. We talked about wetlands. Um, uh, I want to come back to wetlands uh, a, a little bit. I want to come back to what uh, Mike said a little bit because there's something on this slide I want to show you. In order to have a wetland, there's actually four things. Mike said three. The manual says three, but there's actually four. The first, um, the first is you need hydrology. It needs to be wet uh, close to the surface at some uh, for a couple weeks during the year. Then you need hydrophytic. Then these these definitions are all circular. It's just basically what's a wetland? It's land that's wet. You know, frankly. So you need hydrology. You need hydrophytic plants. Simply plants that like it when it's uh, wet. If cactus seeds blow into a wet spot they die. If um, cattails blow in, they thrive. And so that you get. Um, uh, uh, you get certain types of plants that like to live in, uh, in wetlands, and this is really what I want to show you. This is hydric soil. Okay, hydric soil. Soil has uh, iron and manganese in it, and that gives it a reddish color. And when it's wet, the, um, the iron oxidizes rust, but it, uh, it oxidizes anaerobically, and it turns black. And um, it's from the color of the soil. We got these little di we've got these little soil probes, and we have a a color chart. And it's from the color of the soil that we can tell whether it's hydric soil or not. You must have all three. Okay. In addition, there's one more that is like so many things is not written down. Okay. And that is it's subjective. It's the reviewer. This is a true story I'm going, thank you Victoria, this is a true story I'm going to uh, tell you. I sent a wetlands guy out there on a 110 acre uh, property. He said you got 90 acres of wetlands. Literally, 90 acres of wetland. Threw that report in the trash can, sent another guy out there. It's a true story. He said you got two acres of wetlands. Uh, two. We kept that one. I submitted it, and it was approved by DOE. Uh, 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 and these guys will tell you, um, uh, they're, they're, all, they're all good scientists. They'll say, if one of us goes out behind the other, our science is so good, it would be exactly the same. Wrong. It's like anything else. 
Uh, and then I want to leave you tonight with failures, first of all, of land development. Everything is negotiable. Thank you very much. <laughs>